Whether you are a neurology resident, a neurologist, or a technologist, there are five epilepsy form patterns that you cannot afford to miss. You need to recognize these patterns and understand their clinical significance. So let's get started. The first pattern I'm going to discuss is the three per second generalized spike in wave discharges. So let me show you a few pictures and we will discuss as we go along. So this is a typical pattern. This is what we call a three per second spike in wave. These are very high amplitude discharges that you see on the right side and I've cut down the gain. So a spike in wave discharge is a regular symmetrical generalized EEG pattern seen particularly during absence epilepsy. So this is the typical pattern. Let's move along. This is another one where I have not cut down the gain. So you see the spike in wave pattern at seven microvolts per millimeter. This pattern results from thalamocortical oscillations. So there is an oscillation going on between the cortex and the thalamus. A typical absence seizure presents in a young child with spacing out episodes that last for a few seconds. Typically five to 10 seconds, you can see some fluttering of the eyelids. A typical child can have hundreds of these episodes in one day. Many times these patients get sent to us because they are not paying attention in their classes. And what is previously thought of as inattentiveness turns out to be absence seizures. And with proper management, proper treatment, many of these children improve dramatically. So absence seizures with three per second spike in wave should be considered in young children suspected of frequently daydreaming or before initiating treatment for ADHD. Now I should warn you that when you see these kind of patterns, so this uh, is a compressed pattern. So what I've done is I've compressed more than 10 seconds of spike and wave in one page. During the run of spike and wave, this is where you see the child spacing out or with fluttering eyes. If these patients get treated by the wrong medication, so if somebody has these three per second spike and wave and you start treating them with carbamazepine, which is one of the seizure medications, it can actually worsen the spike and wave. So anytime this condition is suspected, the child should be referred to the appropriate specialist or subspecialist as the need may be. This is a patient with absence seizures. This is at the time of the absence seizure. The spike and wave are very high amplitude. I've not cut down the gain here. And this is the same EG. So this EG, I've uh, cut down the gain in the next page. So here you can see that the gain has been cut. And although the first four second appear flattened, the spike and wave discharges can be better appreciated and you can count some are 2.5, some are 3. Typically, this is a 3 per second spike and wave pattern in other parts of this patient's EEG. So the next pattern I'm going to discuss is uh, something called PLEDS or was previously called PLEDS. So according to the new terminology, PLEDS are also called lateralized periodic discharges. This is the new terminology proposed by the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society. Now, these are lateralized sharp wave discharges that recur after a fixed or approximately fixed interval. So you can see this run of this is a period. These are the discharges that I'm talking about, these patterns here. If patients with PLEDs are monitored long enough, approximately 50 to 70% will have will be found to have some kind of an electrographic seizure. So places where they have a continuous monitoring, if these patients are hooked up to EEGs, you may see uh, electrographic seizures in these patients. Uh, this is uh, the same thing looking at a referential montage. The reference SNA, those are just my initials, so this is just a montage created by me, but this is a referential montage. This is basically what I've done is I've compressed the periodic discharges, so periodic lateralized discharges or PLEDs, and you can see more of those discharges in one page. It's always a good practice when you see a run of spikes, a run of periodic discharges, to compress the EG, so look at the EG at 30 millimeter per second, but then also compress it to 10 millimeter per second. And you may be able to identify and appreciate patterns that were not previously seen. Now, these are commonly found in patients with subacute strokes. You can, whenever you see PLEDs, 
whenever you see these lateralized periodic discharges always think about HSV encephalitis uh, if the patient is febrile if there is any reason to suspect that this person has encephalitis you are basically obligated to consider a spinal tap in the right clinical context brain abscess uh, can also give pleds and after status epilepticus or even after some seizures you can see a run of these periodic discharges the term pleds plus was previously used if fast frequencies were superimposed on these discharges and if you have pleds plus then the chances of that person having seizures is much more. Now, I am using some of the terminologies mainly for explaining purposes. If you would like to strictly conform to the most current terminologies and nomenclature, I strongly recommend you review the guidelines provided by the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society. Uh, there was a paper that was published just in 2021 January, I believe, uh, and that goes through all, all these terminologies. Okay, let's move on. So the next pattern I'm going to discuss is something called hypsarrhythmia. This is a pattern seen in pediatric neurology and it's important that if you look at pedi pediatric EGs that you are familiar with this pattern. So this is the pattern that I'm talking about. This is a very abnormal EG pattern often seen in association with infantile spasms. So I'm not going to go in details as to what are infantile spasms. You can read up on infantile spasm. But what you see here is a very disorganized EG. Now what do I mean by disorganized? Let's have a look at what is an organized EG so that you will be able to appreciate a disorganized EG. So this is an organized EG. If so, Sorry about that. So this is an organized EG. What you see here is all, num uh, all channels ending with the odd number are recording from the left side. Channels ending with the even number are recording from the right side. If you look in the frontal channel, the frontal electrodes, frontal recording sites, you see this beta activity. And we, when we look at the parietal occipital uh, region, you see the alpha rhythm. So there is just looking at the CG even without proper labeling, you are able to say what is anterior and what is posterior. But if you go back to this EG, this is disorganized. You cannot say what is anterior, what is posterior. Typically, these kind of patterns are seen with infantile spasms, as I basically said, typically between 6 to 12 months of age. The EG has a very high amplitude. It's disorganized with a poor anterior to posterior differentiation. There are also high amplitude multifocal sharp waves. So you can appreciate some sharp waves here. You can see some sharp waves here. You can see some sharp waves here. Those are multifocal sharp waves. And let me show you some other example. You can see the hypsarrhythmia at different stages of different states. You can see some differences in the patterns. The interesting thing is this pattern tends to disappear or get more organized during the REM sleep. So when this child goes into the REM sleep, you may not necessarily see the disorganized pattern. So this is an important pattern to recognize. This is yet another example of a hypsarrhythmic pattern. And you can see the spikes, multifocal spikes that are there. This is a spike here. This is a spike here. This page appears slightly more organized than the previous page, but still this is a very disorganized EG. The next pattern is centrotemporal spikes. And when I say centrotemporal spikes, I'm talking about these kind of spikes that you see in association with the self-limited focal epilepsy of childhood. Uh, bear in mind that this self-limited focal epilepsy of childhood with centrotemporal spikes was previously known as benign Rolandic epilepsy or benign childhood epilepsy. Uh, so those terms are the same. The current terminology is self-limited focal epilepsy of childhood. The spikes that I'm talking about are the, these type of spikes. So you're seeing these spikes in T3 area and you see these spikes in T4 area. So these are the spikes that you can see both in the temporal region and in the central region. The seizures associated with these spikes are typically lateralized paresthesias or abnormal sensation on the one side of the tongue, lips inside of the cheek or the side of the face. 
These seizures are often at night or in sleep and are associated with a lot of drooling. The good thing is, as the previous name suggested, this is considered benign because a lot of children grow out of these kind of seizures. Let me give you a few more examples here. So this is another EG. You see a longer run of these sharp waves or spikes in the temporal head region. Then if you look over here, same thing, sharp wave discharges, more in sleep now in both T3 and T4. Uh, I'm showing the same EG on a referential montage and you can see the sharp waves here but you also see some sharp waves in the more anteriorly. This is an EG that has been compressed and you're seeing these spikes and sharp waves uh, in the mid-temporal, right mid-temporal region. You see some low amplitude spikes at C3 as well. Epileptiform discharges in this condition can be lateralized, but if you record the EG long enough, you may find it on both hemispheres. This is just another run. Typically during, the, during wakefulness, you will find that the EEG is, uh, has a normal posterior dominant alpha rhythm. So the EG otherwise appears normal. Some more examples here. This is where we see the sharp waves are more prominent in the central region. So you can see the sharps in either the central or the temporal region or a mix of both depends on how long you record the patient. Okay, so the next pattern and the final pattern here is the photoperoxysmal response. And basically this refers to the occurrence of spikes or spike and wave discharges on the EEG in response to intermittent photic stimulation with strobe lights. So when we bring patients in, we also use some uh, provoking factors. We use certain uh, activating procedures. These activating procedures include uh, intermittent photic stimulation and hyperventilation. So in response to photic stimulation, so these red lines that are at the bottom of this EEG are where the patient shows the frequency of the photic stimulation. And you can see that as soon as while this is ending, you start seeing these spike and wave discharges that basically outlast the stimulus. The stimulus ends right here, but the spike and waves continue a couple seconds even after that. So photoperoxysmal response has a strong association with generalized epilepsies and in particular, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, where it can be seen in approximately 35% of individuals. In my experience, the flash frequency of 15 to 20 hertz has the strongest association with, photic, uh, with photoperoxysmal response. Let me show you a few more examples here. This is where the photic stimulation, the photic stimulation in fact induced a seizure. So this is where the child started having a seizure after photic stimulation. Frontally dominant spike and waves on photic stimulation are more likely to be associated with epilepsy than occipital dominant spikes. Although you can see it in both frontally dominant spike and wave and occipital dominant uh, spikes, but in general, at least some of the literature suggests that if the photoperoxysmal response shows frontally dominant spike and wave discharges, then that individual is at a higher risk of having epilepsy. This is just uh, another example here. You don't see the full blown spike and wave as we saw in the previous slide, but here what you see is a burst of slowing which is punctuated with some sharp waves. And many, very often we see these kind of discharges as well. And this does not outlast the photic stimulation for more than a few milliseconds. Now, two to three percent of patients with focal epilepsies may also be photosensitive. It is suggested that focal epilepsies that are genetically inherited are more likely to likely to show photoperoxysmal response than uh, lesional focal epilepsies. These are some other examples of photoperoxysmal response. Okay, now. I have, in my experience, I have seen photosensitive response in patients withdrawing from alcohol, 
and benzodiazepines without a known history of epilepsy. So you sometimes can see photoparoxysmal response even sometimes in some people who do not have epilepsy. Likewise, if somebody has generalized epilepsy and is photosensitive, if you start recording EEGs on siblings, sometimes you will find a higher prevalence of photoparoxysmal response in siblings of individuals who actually have generalized epilepsy with photoparoxysmal response. So thank you so much for your attention. We are done here. I will hopefully talk to you at my next uh, video. Thank you so much for your attention.